apex of human experience conceived in a virgin womb. Heaven's perfection breathes his first in a bar. The fullness of God beats in the heart of a helpless infant. This is the genius of his birth. The requirements of the law outmatched by the righteousness of God. Sovereign simplicity confounds the wisdom of this world. Relentless mercy humbles the proud and heals the broken. This is the genius of his life. The light of the world wrapped in our darkness. Freedom and strength bound in our weakness. The peacemaker pierced, the creator destroyed, the power to save spent not for himself. This is the genius of his cross. Death's signature victory stripped by love's ultimate triumph. Hell's finest hour eclipsed by the dawning of grace. Limitless hope lives again in all who believe. This is the genius of resurrection. The lamb slain so that man no more may die. The suffering servant before whom all will bow. His finished work is the fountain of all new beginnings. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. This is the genius of Jesus. Bless you, church. Come on, stand to your feet. We're in celebration this Sunday. Our God is risen. Sing it out. Say, risen. He's risen forever glorified. You sound good, church. Risen. He's risen. King Jesus. King Jesus.
faithful. Welcome to New Life Covenant, our second service of the day. God is so amazing. We are so blessed that you decided to join us here in Humble Park Community. We are your campus pastors. This is Pastor David, my husband. And I'm Marisol Marrero, his wife. And we welcome you. We welcome you here to our church. <laughs> Listen, if this is your first time, would you wave at me if this is your first time? We want to recognize you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to New Life. Come on, New Life. You can do a better job than that. Thank you for you coming to New Life coming to here this morning. We acknowledge that you could have gone to any other church, but you decided to come to New Life Covenant, and for that we are grateful. And for those that are watching online, we're glad that you are tuning in as well. I want you to know this here today, that we pray for every single chair in this sanctuary. Every single chair. I've asked the elders to cover all four walls of, these, of the corners so that we can declare this day. This is a special Sunday, not just another Sunday. It's a special Sunday. It is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. So listen, we're going to continue to lift up his name. I want you to join us as we continue to worship him. Come on, let's put our hands together. If you're thankful for that resurrection power, I need you to lift up a shout of praise. Let's sing this out. I was buried beneath my shame.
describe it But I can contain it Can't keep it to myself There aren't enough colors To paint the whole picture And not enough words to ever say what I feel
For in the depths of his love, our Savior willingly stepped into the darkness, bearing the burden of humanity's sin and sorrow upon his shoulders. In that profound darkness, a cosmic battle unfolded, a clash of titanic forces as death itself trembled before his divine might. The very foundations of hell quaked beneath his sovereignty, shattered by the unyielding power of his love. Amidst the grave's depths, a fierce war raged on, where the fight against death was waged relentlessly. The one unyielding grip of hell was shattered and broken for all eternity. It's been three days. Three days. 72 hours since I saw them pierce my son with so much anguish that I felt my own heart pierced with such sorrow as I saw my beloved son on the cross. He was crucified in a way that no man should ever have to endure. It was three days ago that I found myself thinking, how, how could this be happening? Could this really be happening? Is this child the one that you gifted me? That same child that, that I carried for nine whole months? You told me, you told me that he would be great. You told me that he would be the son of the most high. I felt the silence overcome me. Tears welled up as my son's body was wrapped and put away behind a tomb. Yet, I am reminded of the words, greater love, greater love no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. What weight of this love that this man would allow the world's sins to rest upon his shoulders. Yet even in the depths of my despair, there was a glimmer of hope. Hope that remains. The words that echo his words, his promises, began to shift my pain. Though the tomb may hold his body, I must cling to faith's light, believing in the power of God's eternal love in redemption saving grace for I know for I know for I know that even death cannot conquer the eternity that is found within his love stand with me.
The savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon him
up that bridge one more time. So we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. The Lamb is overcome. We sing. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. One more time, let's sing that out. The Lamb is we overcome. Sing, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has. The Lamb is overcome. He's overcome. He's overcome, church. He's alive. He's alive. That's something to talk about, church. He's alive. He's alive, yes. God, we worship you and we thank you. Today we celebrate. We can't keep our mouths closed because you are alive. You are alive. Lord, we love you and we honor you and we thank you for what you did. And now we can lift up your name and praise you. God, you're good. You are good. And so be with us, Lord, in this service. Open our hearts and our ears to hear what you have for us. And I pray, Lord, right now that this worship was pleasing unto you and that you felt every word and that you heard our cry and our prayer. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Amen. You all may be seated. Happy Resurrection Sunday! We are so glad that you decided to spend your Easter Sunday here at New Life Covenant. I'm Josh. And I'm Eden. And we have your announcements for this week. We want to take a moment to greet all our first time visitors. We want to thank you so much. We consider you our VIPs. So if you want to head to our lobby in one of our VIP rooms, you can receive your free gift from us to you. Thank you so much for joining us. There are so many things happening throughout the next few months that we are so excited about like honoring our Radiant Women. On May 4th, all of our women are gathering together so that our Radiant Women can honor you. The cost is $40 for the event, and for our Young and Radiant, it's $10. Spots are limited, but please register today on our website. On May 22nd, we'll be having a benefit worship night with our friends, Miel San Marcos. We are so excited because all proceeds will be going to our Chicago Dream Centers. Tickets are $40, and you know who will be joining them? Free worship! Register today at MyNewLife.org. No, no Netflix, Netflix Wednesday. Wednesday! Join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our Bible study as we dive deeper into the Word of God together. In addition, we'll be adding our Spanish Bible study and kids' church between first and fifth graders. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any more questions about our announcements, please visit MyNewLife.org. And these are your weekly announcements. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Praise the Lord. How many excited to be in the house of the Lord on Resurrection Sunday? A lot of people are excited. That connects to my first announcement here. Uh, those of you that are willing to pay post bail for Pastor David, please meet me at the end of service. Uh, we're packed out, beloved. How about a hand praise for the Lord? We're packed out. Uh, we, uh, we have crossed the line. We're illegal right now. We, we're packed out. But we're going we're gonna to preach for the glory of the Lord, beloved, if you would please. We've, ha we've got two overflows. We're in VIP. We're in hospitality. The parking lot is full. This is great that we have a third service, amen. But if you would please, love on your neighbors this way. You might have invited somebody and they're on the way. They're closing the doors here in a few minutes. If you would please, if there's a seat by you that's empty 
or that has a coat or a jacket on it, I'm sure your jacket is awesome, but the person who could take that seat is more awesome than your jacket. How many would say amen? So please create space if you have to move over, if you have to put your hand up to let the ushers know, hey, I have a seat right here. Please, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's just a tiny inconvenience. Amen. Thank you. You are an obedient church. David, you're not going to jail. Mari, you're not going to have to bail him out on Resurrection Sunday. Beloved, my assignment, my official assignment tonight, today is to collect the offering. To collect the offering. Amen. Big givers in second service. Big givers. I'm expecting big checks. Big checks. And the way to give, they'll have those uh, posted up on the screens. However, let's learn something here. Usually what I would do when I have this assignment is that I choose a scripture that is relevant to giving. Uh, choose a scripture that is relevant to tithing. However, today I want to do more than that. Because how many know there's more to this life than just giving? There's giving and living and loving and serving. And in light of that truth today, let's kind of broaden. Let's kind of go deeper. I, I want to share with you something that is intimate for me, a scripture that is very familiar. But you have to be careful because when scriptures become too familiar, I know that scripture, they become less inspiring. You have to honor it. You have to... That it has to be sacred to you. This morning I got up and I sent this scripture to my family, to my children. I said, read it to my grandchildren. I, I have an unborn grandchild on the way. I said, read it to that boy or to that girl, whatever. And to remember that this is what we stand on here. Let this be your inspiration for giving. There's so much more. Beloved, you get to choose your attitude as a believer. And as a believer, you should have an attitude. How many would say amen? And we definitely have an attitude in Humble Park. Who has a Humble Park attitude? I certainly do. All right. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says. I'm in Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. There's two holidays right there, Christmas and Good Friday. But what is it about today? What is it about this afternoon? Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Beloved, I'm going to ask you to stand if you would, please. Let this be your foundation. Let this be your inspiration that there is more to this life than just giving there is living and loving and serving the Bible describes Jesus this way in the book of Colossians that he is the firstborn of the dead the firstborn of the resurrection beloved over 2,000 years many believers men and women and children have died for the cause of Christ but only one your Lord my Lord and my Savior has resurrected. How many would say amen? Take your tithing and your offering. Hold it up to the Lord. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Like this scripture says, we bow our knee. We confess with our tongue that you, Jesus, are our Lord to the glory of the Father. What we've received came from you, and we are grateful. And it is a great grace and privilege to bring it back. Take it, Lord. Receive it as worship. Receive it as honor. Receive it as sacrifice. Receive it as love. Multiply it. Bless those less fortunate than us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
he's in love with you no matter your history he's still in love with you that here this morning he is still in love with you no matter how many times we've tried to run from God he's still in love with you no matter how many times we've doubted God he's still in love with you no matter how many times we have sinned against God he's still in love with you that is the message of God and that is the language of God which is love not just any type of love but agape love, which is unconditional love. How many of y'all can receive that here this morning? Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. And then I'm going to shoot over to John chapter 19. We'll read verses 41 and 42. For those of you that are in the overflow... I declare that holy ground. And I know that you may not be in the sanctuary, but the same God that is in here is also over there. So I pray that you will lean in because I believe that God is going to use this message to touch hearts. And we're glad for those that are watching online. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Now the Lord God had planted a garden. I want you to shout out garden. He planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life. I want you to shout out and. There, there's another tree. And this tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. I want you to shoot over to John chapter 19. Verses 41 and 42. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Shout out garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I want you to repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden 
in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light for my path. I will seek you with all my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. You may be seated. I'm going to close off our sermon series on the redemption story. For those who are fairly new or new here for the first time, every month we like to start a collection of different topics. And on the top of the month, we have a theme. And the theme for this month is the redemption story. Now, if you've missed any of the Sunday sermons, you don't have to worry because I'm going to be able to share a word that is going to bring it all together. The Bible teaches us that there was a garden. There were two separate gardens. The title that I selected for today's sermon is from garden to garden. From garden to garden. When Jesus created earth, he created a garden that was called Eden. And before Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, there was no evidence of life. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that God planted. And since there was no rain yet, God created a mist to water what was planted. By the time Adam was created, he was placed in the garden. And the Bible says that God breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living creature. Now the garden is a designated place where its design and purpose is to produce. A garden is a designated area where flowers and shrubs, vegetables, fruits, and herbs are cultivated in a plot of ground. Now, Without nourishment and care, life in a garden will be threatened by death. Without sun and without water. Without God sending the mist before he even sent the first raindrop there would never be product of life think about all that you and I gain with gardens food for both human and animals trees for clean air and shelter plants that provide spices medicine and more now, I really enjoy nature because it is good for my soul I don't know how many of you enjoy nature going to the forest preserve being able to see the trees that are lined up and the greenery it gives life my wife and I have taken walks through the forest preserve and while we're working out physically we are also taking in the life source of the garden for the past three years there's a group of us here at the church we would gather together and we would go to the preserve the forest preserve and we would bike ride and there's something about just cruising through nature and cruising through the garden that, that, that is refreshing to my soul. What the garden produces cannot be underestimated. Because in its nature, the garden's purpose is to give. And I know every day we walk outside and we don't necessarily take moments and time to reflect the beauty of God's creation. The life giving that nature has given to us. Now out of all the places that God could have chosen to create Adam and Eve and place them in. He chooses a garden. Now the interesting fact about the garden is that God clearly gives Adam a command. And here's what he tells him. I want you to work. The garden and I want you to keep it in other words I want you to care for it I want you to work it and care for it Adam I've given you everything that you need all I need you to do is grab the resources I've given you so that you can produce more fruit I'm here to tell you today that God has given you everything that you need Many of us are overlooking what we have in our own hands because we're looking at what we got half empty. 
And yet God is saying, do you see that staff that you have in your hand? I can use that to split the Red Sea. You know that staff that you have in your hand? I can use it for you to strike a rock and water can come out of it. If you understand that if you just recognize that God has given you what you need, then you can give it right back to God and he would provide for you. This is, this is what's happening in the garden. Everything is already there. Everything is already set up for them. God always prepares us to succeed, not to fail. If you don't work the garden, then you won't reap the benefits of the garden. Because gardens, they need to be cared for. Gardens need to be taken care of. If you want to see more fruit, then you're going to have to prune. You're going to have to remove dead branches, pull weeds, and cultivate the ground. If there's things in your life that you don't like, then you're going to have to make some decisions to make the changes that you want. Some of these changes are difficult, but it will be worth it. Some of these changes are not easy, but you're looking at the end result of the decisions that you're making today. Don't keep around stuff in your life that you don't want in your future. If it's going to compromise your future, if it's going to compromise your joy, if it's going to compromise your peace, then you ought to work the ground today to get rid of what is making you compromise when God is saying more fruit is coming your way. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell them you got to work the ground. You got to turn the soil. You can't be lazy people. <laughs> I believe that there is a spiritual significance to this all. That the garden was meant for us. It is in our benefit that gardens have life. It is in our best interest that gardens produce. God did not create us to be lazy. But to be responsible beings. I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back. God did not create us to be lazy but to be responsible beings. God did not create us to be irresponsible do you hear me in the overflow he didn't create you and I to be irresponsible by neglecting our responsibilities neglecting our soul neglecting our faith like a garden we have to take care of ourselves you know some of our neglect is not based on our laziness but the lack of focus and intentionality of oneself we can be serving in ministry Serving our spouse, serving our children, our friends, community, and yet dying inside because we've neglected ourselves. Working multiple jobs, but we're neglecting ourselves. Being in, in people's lives at the, at the sound of a call, but yet we're neglecting ourselves. Preparing to serve others. Preparing to serve the homeless in our community. Preparing to serve the hurting. And we give and we give, but yet we neglect ourselves. To neglect one thing is to pick something else up. If, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to run into fumes. If you are not mindful of where you're at. You're not mindful of where your mental health is at, where your emotional health is at. You're going to run into fumes. And I'm here to tell you that if you want to be the best version of yourself, the best version of yourself to your family, to your community, to your job, to your purpose, then you've got to be renewed. You have got to be refreshed. You have got to be restored. I can only be my best for you. When I am intimate with the Lord, I can only be my best with you when my wife and I are in a healthy relationship. I can only be my best for you when my children and I are locked in together. I got to take care of my home, but I got to take care of myself. So when I neglect myself, I'm picking up these other things. But what's happening is that internally we're being defected. And hurt 
If you neglect your soul, you, you won't find what, you're, what you really need. And you would pick up what eventually can kill you. You have a work mentality. You have a work mentality. You have a do mentality. But Jesus on the seventh day, he told us how to rest. How to be able to sit back and see the things that we've cared for. To be able to appreciate how far God has taken us. For some of us, there's been many victories in our life, but we don't even pause to reflect the small victories that we have encountered. We are waiting for the big explosion in our life. We're waiting for the big payday. But aren't you grateful of the simple fact that you still have a job? Aren't you grateful that you still got breath? Aren't you grateful that you're not where you used to be? Celebrate the small victories. Aren't you grateful that you were barren one day and in the next day you are now pregnant with child? Aren't you grateful? Celebrate the small victories. The small victories will continue to accumulate. And you can use that as a weapon to remind yourself, God has been good to me. And you can remind Satan when he tries to remind you otherwise how good God has been to you. Don't neglect your soul. Marriages die because of neglect. Friendships grow apart because of neglect. Look at what it says in Matthew 16, 26. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What well, Judas learned the hard way. That a few coins is not worth the betrayal of the Savior. It's just not worth it. That job, listen to me, is not worth it. That relationship where it's unequally yoked, it is not worth it. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? That payday is just not worth it. Because what you're going to find is that when you get there, you're going to want more of it. You will never be satisfied. You will never feel as if you have reached the pit of your life. What I'm trying to encourage you is that there's something that is missing and that is called your soul. Don't compromise your soul. Don't forfeit your soul. Don't compromise your relationship with Jesus. The garden is meant for you to care for. And spiritually speaking, if you want to receive the blessing of what is planted, you have to cultivate the ground. How, Pastor D? Through prayer. Amen. Have you neglected prayer? Through community. Have you rejected or neglected community? Have you become too busy to come together? Have, have you become too busy to spend some time and you have neglected God's word? Do not neglect his word. Do not neglect prayer. Do not neglect in coming together. It was in the garden that Adam and Eve neglected the commands of God. And because of that, they picked up their shame. They picked up guilt. They, they, they picked up fear. When you neglect one thing, you're going to end up picking something else up. When you neglect God, can I just tell you, the outcome of what you're going to pick up is anything that is opposite of. And many of us, we sit back and we're wondering, why am I in the place that I'm in? Because you've neglected God. You've neglected Him. You have, you have pushed God away from your life for whatever reason. You've neglected Him. And the worst thing that you and I can ever do is push God away from us. When you and I neglect God, we are falling into the trap and the despise of the enemy himself who is the father of lies. Neglect. The Bible teaches us that God placed two trees in the garden. The first tree was the tree of life. That was the tree in which God says, I want you to eat from this tree. I want you to be restored when you eat from it. This is the place that would give you an abundance. But there is another tree. And this tree is called good and evil. See, instead of avoiding or eliminating any threats in the garden, they entertained it. They meaning Adam and Eve. See, in the garden, as I reflected in reading scripture, I said, God, 
Why did you put a tree that would benefit Adam and Eve and another tree that would harm them? And the Lord spoke to me and said, David, because when it comes to love, love is a choice. And when God created humanity, the Bible says that he created us in his image. And he created us so that we can be in relationship with him. So in order for there to be a relationship, then there needs to be two people that choose each other. And God says, I choose you. But here is two trees. Do you choose me? You can choose me by eating from the tree of life, which is obedience, or you can reject me from eating from the tree of good and evil. And if you choose evil, then you have made your choice. Because of neglect, the Bible says that Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, disobeying God. Sin is disobedience to God. This is where the redemption story begins. The Bible says that God kicks out Adam and Eve from the garden. But God is again doing the work. God loves man so much that in his rich mercy, he transplants Adam and Eve to the world. Why would God remove them from the garden of Eden? Let me tell you why. Because anytime God takes you from one place and transplants you to another he doesn't want you to go back to the sin that you have committed. When God transplants you, the Bible says that he put a cherub, an angel to guard the entrance. God don't want you to go back. God wants you to move forward. And you got to hear me here today, new life. That as God placed them into a new realm, what that means is that there is a new covenant. And now we know that in the new covenant that there is grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to stay where you are because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And when you accept them, the old has gone. The Garden of Eden. And the new has come. God placed the angel to guard the entrance. Avoiding them to enter. What God was doing is protecting Adam. Protecting Eve for what? For his redemption plan. Some of y'all are frustrated because God has transplanted you. But little do you know that God has transplanted you from a place of sin into a new place, a realm where God is saying, here is where the redemption story will begin in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says this. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It is in Christ Jesus that we can become the righteousness of him. It was for Adam and Eve's benefit that God removed them from Eden. God is the arbitrator of what is right and what is wrong. And when man chose disobedience, Jesus came to restore our broken relationship with him. Man was responsible for bringing sin into this world. Jesus Christ was responsible for redeeming us in providing the way through his resurrection. The garden 
was the most beautiful place you can imagine. The man and woman who lived there walked with God. They talked with him, and he talked back. Were they friends? They were friends. Anything they wanted in the whole garden was theirs. They were so very happy. They even got to name the animals. But the most beautiful part of the garden were the trees. The trees surrounded the entire garden, and they were magnificent. The branches on every tree looked as if they reached into the sky. And on every branch was the most beautiful What is it? 
I saw him in my dream. You saw who? Our redemption. You said you trusted God would make a way. Yeah. He does. He sends his son as a sacrifice for us. His name is Jesus. Come on, somebody give him some praise. I said give him some praise. Jesus has risen from the dead. He is a redeemer. He did what he said he will do. While there are thousands of religions, while there are thousands of religions, there's only one that has risen from the dead, and his name is Jesus. Somebody give him some praise in this place. minutes have a seat give me five minutes the original sin in the first garden was fully redeemed in the second garden where the sins of this world were defeated the Bible says near where they sacrificed Jesus was a garden where they laid him in a tomb you heard it right the tomb was in a garden a place that produces Life, And in Luke chapter 24, when the women disciples went to the tomb with spices to see Jesus, they found the stone rolled away as they entered the tomb. But they didn't find Jesus. Was he lost? Did they take him? Flabbergasted, confused, they wondered what happened to Jesus. And scripture reads, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed the lighting stood beside him. In their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I have come to tell people here today that Jesus is not in the tomb. So if you are looking in empty places trying to find life, you won't find it there. And I've come to ask you the very same question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Did you come to church today to look at an empty tomb? Are you searching at places that you thought might have fulfilled you? You thought that relationship would fill you? You thought that alcohol would fill you? You thought that friendship would fill you? You thought, you thought, but it left you empty? Have you lost hope? Have you lost faith? Is it possible you're looking for God in all the wrong places? Why are you wasting your time in a tomb where there's dead people? Why are you placing our hope in a tomb that is empty? Our hope is not in an empty tomb. It's in the one who no longer is in the tomb. I want to tell you that Christ walked out of the tomb. And when Christ walked out, we walked out right with him. I thought I was going to get a better shout on that one. I said, when God walked out, then we walked out with Him. And can I tell you, you know what stayed in the tomb? Your depression stayed in the tomb. You know what stayed in the tomb? Your pain and your suffering and your agony. That stayed in the tomb. But when Jesus came out, the Bible says that morning is just for a night. But joy. Jesus was 
planted in the tomb. In the tomb. He was on Mount Calvary. But when he died, they placed him in the garden. In the garden. And before the garden where he was laid, there was another garden that was called Gethsemane. That was the garden where the Bible said that he prayed and God heard his prayer and he sent an angel to strengthen him. You have got to create a space, a garden where you cry out to God and he will give you the strength you need to endure the suffering. I have told you over and over that when you pray, you don't start preparing to pray while you are ready in the battlefield. You have got to get ready before the battle comes before you. And you have got to go before God in prayer and tell him, God, I need your strength because I know what's ahead of me is going to be hard. And I don't know what's ahead of you today. And I don't know what you've been suffering or where you've been suffering. But all I do know is that you are one cry away from God blessing you. All I know is that it is possible you have been praying in an empty tomb when God is saying, I need you to start praying in a garden where it's going to produce some life. When Jesus walked out, when he walked out of the tomb, over 500 witnesses saw Jesus that was alive. No other religion would declare their God to be alive because they are all dead. But when it comes to Jesus, witnesses, historically witnesses declare, I saw him on that cross. I saw him be pierced on his side. I saw him breathe his last. I saw him dead. I saw him be taken down from the cross. I saw him being put inside of a tomb. I saw when they rolled a ton, pound stone to guard the tomb. I saw when they were legions of an army blocking the tomb. And none of that held him down one day they thought that he was dead two days they thought that he was dead but here comes the resurrection here comes the third day here comes life and life in abundance he was on the third day because on that cross the bible says that he gave up his spirit what does that mean he went to heaven his soul went to Haiti and he grabbed the keys of death. And on the third day, his spirit reunited with his body. His soul reunited with his body. And he rose from the grave and he walked out. I said that he walked out of the grave. And when he walked out of the grave, not even death can hold him down. When I've come to tell you, I know weapons formed against you but there is no weapons that shall prosper because we serve a God that is alive and he is well I need you to lift up your hands all over this place he is alive and he is well and I'll give you 30 seconds right now to call on your king go We're talking about the inner man. Come on, go. You need him, you need him, you need him. You can't do it by yourself. Depression is about to strangle you. You can't do it by yourself. 
that divorce is about to strangle you. Come on. That spirit of suicide is about to kill you. You can't do this by yourself. Ain't no money going to buy you peace. Ain't no relationship going to keep you whole. There's only one by the name of Jesus. I want to do a call out for those of you who are in this space. For those of you that are in overflow, this is for you. Jesus already walked out. You have no business remaining in the tomb. Today's your opportunity. The same opportunity that God gave Adam, He has given us today. Which tree are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the tree of life? Or are you going to choose the tree of knowledge? Which tree? Because no one can make that decision but you. This is your responsibility. This is your moment. And this is your time. With every eyes closed and head bow. From those in the sanctuary. To those in the overflow. To those that are watching online. Jesus chose you. And he wants to know today. Do you choose him? If you want to decide to make that decision to choose Jesus, right where you're at, I want you to lift up your hands. And by you lifting up your hands, what you're saying is, God, save me. I see hands that are lifted all over this place. Come on, anybody else in this space? This is not by chance or coincidence. I believe that this is a divine appointment. For those of you that are in the overflow, this is for you. Come on. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you choose him, if you choose life, then I'm here to tell you you're going to choose abundance. If you're in the overflow, I want you to get out of your seats and I want you to make your way all the way up to the sanctuary. Make your way up to this altar. For those of you that lift up their hands and you're in the sanctuary, come on. I need you to walk out of your chair and meet me in the sanctuary. I want you to choose life and not death. Come on. The devil is a liar. There's no reason why you should be suffering alone. There's no reason why you should be broken alone. There's no reason why you should live without Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. He is God. He is God. He is God. He is God of heaven and He is God in earth. I'm here to tell you right now, He is sitting at the right hand of the Father and is interceding in your behalf. He's still doing His work. Every depression shall be broken right now. Come on. Every drug addiction shall be casted down. Every lost spirit shall be taken out. I pray divorce free in this house. I pray freedom in your mind and freedom in your heart. Every spirit that is trying to keep you down. I call out Satan right now. In the same way it says in Genesis 3.15. I pray that God would crush the head of the serpent. And I pray that freedom would be delivered in the name of Jesus. standing in your chairs I want you to begin to lift up your hands this is your moment this is your time free worship is going to lead us in let us open up our hearts to Jesus in this next few moments go hallelujah you have won
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Beloved, those of you who came to the altar and gave your life to Christ, interesting story about the garden. God, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had to be put out of the garden. They could no longer be in God's presence. He had to dispatch them out. However, an interesting thing happens, beloved. Before he puts them out of the garden, the Bible says that he covered them in the skin of animals. The same God who created you always had the intention to save you. Why couldn't they just run from one tree to the other? After they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, why couldn't they just run to the tree of life? Because if they would have ate, eaten from that tree, beloved, they would have lived forever in their sin. Yeah. They would have been unsavable. Everyone in hell is unsavable. God had to put them out. And perhaps you have felt far away from God. You've been dispatched. You've felt estranged from the Lord. But, beloved, it was always God's intention to save you, to redeem you. That's what we're celebrating today. It was always the plan to cover you. Remember that. Here's the decision. Here's how the decision works. Let's do this real quick. I had to do this. We all had to do this. I had to confess that I'm a sinner. I had to confess that in my life I had been disobedient and selfish. I want you to confess right now. I confess I'm a sinner. I also had to believe this the ground that we're standing on here, this platform is black. That is the truth. That is the reality. It's not red or yellow. It's black. That is reality. We have to believe, appropriate as truth, the fact that Jesus came and died and rose again. If you believe that, say, I believe that. And finally, beloved, and this is critical, because the Bible says that even the demons believe they tremble. What is going to set us apart? Here's what sets us apart. We accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Say it right now. I accept you as my Lord. Welcome to the family, beloved. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the first day of the rest of your life in the abundance of the Lord. You decided to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The QR code is up there. We want to get the opportunity to know you. How many have had a great time today? All right, amen. We're a little tired. We got one more service to go. Pastor D is going to be in the foyer greeting people. Be still. Be courteous as you leave. Receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you, beloved. May the Lord be gracious unto you, and may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace throughout this week. And the people of God say, go with God, go in peace, be nice to the parking people, go invite someone you love who doesn't know Jesus back for the 1230, for the 1230 service.
Jesus lives in me. You got it? I'm alive again because Jesus lives in me. You say it. I'm alive again because Jesus lives in me. Everybody say I'm alive again because Jesus lives in me. Come on, church. Worship fill this room. Real worship, come on. Yeah. Come on, I hear them. I want to hear you. Come on. This is real simple. When you got it, I want you to sing. It says this Holy Father, you are my heart's desire. So lay me on your own. Till I'm full of fire. Let's sing it again. Holy Father, you are my heart's desire. So lay me on your altar until I'm full of fire. I love this part. It says, Have your way, have your way. Until I'm 